This is IAQ Radio, Indoor Air Quality Radio, the voice of the indoor air quality industry, with your hosts, Radio Joe Hughes and the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. And now, Radio Joe Hughes. Good day and welcome to IAQ Radio Plus. Today's episode 575 and we're going to have an open mic with a great panel of speakers and listeners and I really hope we get some good good conversation going here. We have John Downey, John Lapoter, Jack Springston, Mike McGinnis, and Don Weeks joining us for an open mic show. Uh, the first half we're going to talk a little bit about the recent conference season, uh, some some current events, and then for the second half we want to get our, our uh, panel's expert opinions on how the coronavirus might affect our industry. And uh, Cliff and I are also lining up a show with um, Dr. Alan Zelikoff. Hopefully we'll have that for you next week. Uh, He joined us for the H1N1 and also for the Ebola events that occurred many years back now. And uh, looking forward to talking to him next week. So before we get started, let's thank our sponsors. I also want to thank our gold sponsors, Particles Plus, Healthy Indoors Magazine, Gray Wolf Sensing Solutions, and AEML Inc. Laboratory. And of course, our association sponsors, Siri, the Cleaning Industry Research Institute, the Indoor Air Quality Association, and the Restoration Industry Association. I also want to thank the ACGIH, the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists, uh, for being our most recent sponsor and uh, very very happy to have them on board all right let's get to the trivia question john and now you can win a cool prize it's time for the iaq radio trivia question be the first to correctly answer simply email your answer to c zlotnick at cs.com or if listening live just text your answer from your computer and now Here's the Z-Man with this week's IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Hello, everyone. Congratulations go out to Vic Cafaro, Richmond, Virginia, who was first to identify Lupercalia as the ancient Roman festival from which Valentine's Day evolved. The IAQ Radio Trivia Question for today, Friday, February 28, 2020, has been sponsored by Ideas the solution chemistry company providing unique solutions to odor removal, surface cleaning, and decontamination problems. Here's today's IAQ radio trivia question. Name the four known genesis in the coronavirus family. Back to you, Joe. Hmm. Interesting, Cliff. We'll see if uh, anybody can come up with that one. Let's get started here. We've got a great panel. I want to go around the horn. It's conference season. Uh, We just had the IAQA conference and the AEML winter break, both big successes. Uh, I think maybe what we'll do is start with, let's let's start with Mr. Donnie. Do we have John Donnie on the line here? Yeah, I'm here, Joe. Hi, John. Welcome. And uh, John, what... What can you tell listeners that maybe either you learned or picked up over these past this past week or what you tried to convey, convey to others? Well, I was uh, at the both IAQA and the AEML training uh, somewhat on a mission to um, uh, spread the word about a conference in 2021 that Siri is doing uh, with ISIAC, the International Society of Indoor Air Quality and Climate. So consequently, you know, I, that, that was, that's a little bit self-serving, but that was the, the primary purpose uh, in my trip was to see some people and talk to them about what we were doing. Uh, having said that, you know, first of all, I was very impressed with how IAQA, uh, how that conference went in terms of attendance, in terms of exhibitors, uh, Jay and the crew at IAQA, the board and, and the new management company have done a really good job, I think, of uh, kind of, t- I know, this may be a little bit strong, but to some extent, rebirthing IAQA. And I think that it, that was that's an important um, accomplishment that they've made. Uh, the other thing, as far as the AML um a conference, which is a training session. Uh, 
the the I guess what I was most impressed with there was how well attended it was, how uh, strong the speakers were, including McGinnis. Although I sh <laughs> I'd rather say in spite of McGinnis, but uh, John was uh, up early and uh, was both very informative and very entertaining. I got a lot of good feedback um, concerning uh, actually. Uh, Mike, as well as uh, other speakers, as far as their the quality and depth of what they were presenting. And, right. Again, very well attended. It was uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 150 people there. They actually sold out and had to scramble in order to have enough um, uh, seating for everyone. Let's let's get over to Mike McGinnis for a minute. Mike, what were you trying? You know, you, you did a presentation uh, at the AML winter break. I'm wondering what you were trying to convey to the people there and uh, how you felt it went. Well, uh, uh, I was talking about uh, health and safety in OSHA and just an introduction to OSHA. And I reminded everybody in case they forgot that uh, their most valuable commodity in their company, if you want to look at it like that, is their employees. And the more money you invest in your employees, the more money you invest in their health and safety, the more it'll come back to uh, pay you know, dividends many times over as far as having smarter employees, safer employees, as far as working safer, and as far as protecting the people whose homes are. Oh, I think we may have lost Mike there. Hopefully he didn't have an accident. <laughs> All right, let's go over to... Don Weeks, Don, you were at both events. Uh, give us some things you learned or what you tried to convey to others. Well, I, first of all, I, I, unfortunately, I couldn't. I, I didn't make it to the uh, the winter break. I, I was at the IQA <coughs> conference, and uh, and then I decided to take some time off, which is why I'm still in Florida at this point, um, looking at the movies and. Uh, and, and basically enjoying the beaches. But at the uh, IQA uh, conference, I mean, it certainly was impressive to see the uh, uh, number of attendees and, and number of uh, exhibitors. And uh, the expo was a lively place uh, all, almost the entire time. Um, and I think that uh, all can agree that from a from financial viewpoint, uh, the conference was highly successful. Um, and I think that the attendance uh, reflected the, um, the, the ability of IQA to to manage its own affairs uh, and run its own conference. The first time it's done it in, I think, 12 or 13 years. So um, certainly that bodes well for the future. And I'm, I'm hoping to, to see uh, uh, even more improvements in uh, when we were next year in uh, Austin, Texas uh, uh, in February. So I think the conference, uh, AH management and uh, Jay Stake and the, and the board of directors and the, and the, uh, and the um, convention uh, a committee led by uh, Alice uh, Delia d did an excellent job on getting people uh, to attend. Uh, as it turns out, uh, there were free tracks, and quite frankly, looking at the overflow nature of the uh, of those rooms, we could easily have run a fourth track. Uh, you know, we're going to be that many attendees. So I think the final total was like 500 or, uh, or something of that nature. Um, so I'm hoping that, uh, that that will attract even um, um, more people next year and that uh, that the conference uh, will be a big su success building on the one that they had this year. Don, what, what did you present on? Um, I presented on what you and I had talked about previously, uh, my, my goodness, a whole year ago, it seems, or at least nine months ago, which is the, on the AIHA uh, publication with regards to mold, um, airborne mold um, through uh, um, basically the sampling and the analytical, the, the uh, frequently asked questions and some of the, uh, the problems with uh, doing spore trap type of analysis. And um, I, I can only look at what, how many people signed up to attend it. There's over 90 people who, who attended it, or I should say signed up to attend it. And I think we probably had an old folk uh, uh, number of people, probably about 100, 110, somewhere in that nature. Uh, I made it interactive as much as I could. I, I did speak for about uh, 25, 30 minutes and left the last 20 minutes to, uh, to questions and answers. And there were some excellent questions and a lot of discussion um, about uh, the various problems with uh, sport trap and uh, sampling and analysis. And I'm hoping I convinced some folks that, uh, that they should be doing other types of sampling 
as well as the um, Schwarzkopf to really evaluate whether or not there's a need for um, additional cleanup and remediation and that uh, people recognize that when you're doing this type of sampling, it isn't necessarily true, uh, a true representation of what type of mold spores you might have in the, in the environment. It's just a snapshot in time. So it's an interesting uh, topic for, I think, a lot of people who have done, as, as, as we started a, a little uh, program there uh, called, uh, um, you know, similar to AA, uh, this is MA, which is that uh, you announce your name and you say, I sample from mold. <laughs> I've done weeks and I sample for mold, and that's my confession, like my confession about what I'm doing right now. And I think we can start spreading that out as an MA across the country. So, was it? Do you think there will be less mold spore trap sampling, or maybe better directed mold spore sampling? I mean, just from the um, from the feedback you got from people at the conference, were they buying it or were they kind of like, we're going to continue doing what we do. This is what we've done for years. It works for us. And uh, thanks, but no thanks. Oh, no, I, I don't think it was quite that dramatic a change. But I do think people will now think twice before they just rely on, on uh, sport track sampling, particularly on the, on the investigative side as well as the clearance side. Um, a lot of people didn't even recognize, didn't even know that there was a difference between the types of analysis uh, or analysts that are, are doing this type of work and what laboratories they need to go with. Uh, one, one gentleman came up to me afterwards and, and thanked me because he didn't know that there was a, a you know, there was a program from AIHA that de dealt with uh, quantification of mold samples and that the, uh, this having the lab, the lab ana analysts uh, compete uh, in round robins isn't sufficient. You need to have a quality control program within the laboratory, which is what's required under the AMPATH uh, type of program. Uh, so I think there's going to be a lot more scrutiny about what they're doing, as well as probably some uh, additional information that they'll provide to their client as to you know the potential errors that may be in, inherent in this type of process. And I think there'll be, as I mentioned, uh, I think there's probably going to be an additional need for, to do other types of sampling, perhaps go back to the old uh, uh, cultural type of, of analysis um, and hmm. supplement to what's done with the sport traps, yeah. as well as looking at new types of analysis out there that are going to be more exacting in terms of the uh, what you're going to have in the air. So I think there was an impact. I don't think most people walk away thinking that they should continue to do what they're doing. I think they are in errors in the uh, in the actual analysis and, and in the sampling is too as well. All right. Well, thank you, Don. Let's go to John Lapoteer. John, you you were at both events. Uh, I know a big part of the reason uh, I suspect um, that winter break was successful was that people could get all of their continuing education credits there for the state of Florida. I guess every two years you have to get what is it, fourteen credit hours? I don't know. You could you know better than I do, John. Um, how's that working? I mean, is it, do you think it's helping? professionalize the industry more the licensing uh the licensing alone no i don't i don't think so how about the renewal credit requirement i think the renewal credit requirement is a good thing but you can get your education from virtually anybody uh, in the industry and it, it rates from from free to you know affordable to expensive and that does not reflect the quality uh, of the training the training at winter break was top tier the training at IAQA was top tier. It cost a little bit more, but you had 500 people at IAQA, another 150 at winter break. Um, those people are hungry for good, solid information and good, solid education. So it works for the people that want it. Some people are just looking to get their credits. Yeah, I'm curious what other highlights you, you came away from, uh, especially I, I didn't, you know, I've been to IAQA 18 out of the last 20 years. Unfortunately, my back didn't allow me to go this year, but uh, I, I, I've never been able to make it to, well, I guess it's the first AEML winter break and uh, big focus on, um, you know, Florida-related continuing education. Do you think things are changing at all in Florida? I know in the past on the show you've been a little, um, I don't know, I guess a little, a little disappointed with how the regulation has worked and with how people in the state are handling mold inspection and assessment and uh, clearance. Do you think um, maybe there's there's a desire to change and, and get a little better? 
Well, I think one of the number one questions that I was asked during both IAQA and winter break was how do we raise the bar? And, and that's extremely difficult, and we've been attempting to do it since we, we tried licensing as a method to raise the bar. Uh, the problem is people are making a living collecting air samples and passing off a lab sample and calling it a mold assessment, and they're doing quite well. And if you ask them to do more for quite possibly less, I don't think there's ever going to be a chance that they're going to do that so long as everybody accepts, or the people they work with, accept the collection of air samples as a mold inspection. I think for us as an industry, that starts top down from the insurance industry down, changing the insurance uh, industry's opinion of what constitutes a mold inspection. Unfortunately, in Florida, we continue to have legislation introduced to limit coverage for the insured. So currently, there's uh, legislation introduced to limit water loss, and it's going to be essentially the same as the limitations of a mold loss, and that's going to stem from the, the exaggeration of water losses and the overwhelming amount of Category 3 water loss in recent years. And the, the insurance companies are now saying enough is enough. We're going to limit that loss unless you purchase specific additional coverage. So in Florida, it's, it's still the wild, wild west. Uh, we can provide the education. We can raise the bar. We can uh, inform. But uh, it's you're hard-pressed to make a substantial change in the way that a lot of people practice in the state of Florida. Cliff, let me turn it over to you. Do you have any uh, questions for our guests or comments? No, I'm just writing away, Joe. Oh, let me also get Jack Springston in here. Jack, I know you didn't make it down to the to the conferences, but you work in New York State. They also have a licensing law in New York State. Uh, there's some continuing education requirements there. I'm wondering if you had any comment on uh, what the guys are saying about what's going on in Florida. Are you seeing similar things in New York? Um, yeah, the, the, the quality of the inspectors uh, obviously uh, widely ranges depending on, on their experience and, and um, background. Um, and, and the law you know, really it didn't, didn't improve um, uh the quality of, of the inspectors okay and how many people do you know I'm, I'm just curious i think in florida there are six or seven thousand people licensed now to do either assessment or remediation and john will correct me if i'm wrong there what about new york state uh jackie any, any idea how many people there are licensed now to do this type of work uh i do not Okay. John, am I correct with that number? What was that number you had, John? I thought it was six or 7,000 people licensed in Florida right now. Yeah, I think that's pushing 8,000 right now. 8,000 people. That just floors me at times that uh, there's that many people doing this kind of work and 500 of them showed up at IAQA. You know, you know probably maybe a quarter of those were from Florida. And uh, 150 showed up at the AEML event. Um, where are these other folks getting their education from, John? Well, a lot of them are getting it free. A lot of them are getting it online. But I, I think the scariest part of the 8,000 is that when it comes to remediation and, and assessment in the state of Florida, you don't need to have a license. You need to be supervised by someone that has a license. So each license holder can have multiple people that they're supervising under them. So it, it's the number is substantially higher, which makes our attendance by licensees and those supervised by licensee even worse. But the vast majority of them aren't looking to make their job any more difficult. They're looking to continue making money with the ease that they are, which is the collection of air samples for mold spores, calling it air quality samples and a mold inspection and moving on with their business. And that training uh, can be had online, in many cases, free. Hmm. I didn't realize that. I thought I thought they had to be in person. I think in New York, Jack, correct me if I'm wrong, there's one, in fact, I want to ask a question about this group next, uh, one training provider approved to do the continuing ed online. Um, yeah, as far as, I, as far as I know, I think Bob Krell is the only one. Uh, who is approved to do it's um, right the refresher class which is required every two years every two years how many hours is that a, a full day 
Yeah, I was, I was about to say, uh, no, it's only four hours. Okay. Four hour refresher every two years in New York. Um, Jack, you're close to New Jersey. Are they still looking at maybe some kind of licensing? Um, periodically, they do. Uh, they almost passed um, a regulation um, years ago when, when uh, Governor Christie was there, uh, and he chose not to sign it, and it, and it uh, died on his desk. Okay. Hey, let me let me get back to um, Miss. Um, someone Jack mentioned Bob Crow, and I actually have a text question about Bob's presentation here. What happened with Bob Crow's IAQA keynote? Bob is a, a really uh, unique speaker. He brings a lot of energy. Um, somebody can maybe I don't know John or whoever saw that Don. Maybe Don, did you did you catch that? And how'd it go? Yeah, I, I did catch it. Uh, it, was, it was an entertaining, as always, uh, presentation from Bob. Um, I think uh, I would say the following is that uh, because he, he was uh, the keynote speaker, he actually was a, li a bit more tame than he normally is, which is may, may or may not be that good. But he was certainly very informative, and uh, he went through the history a little bit of, of indoor air clutch on that. I, I think he, uh, he and uh, Ian were, uh, were competing on that. And more Ian, I think, spent more time on what the future might be uh, going forward in the next decade. And uh, I think that the presentations were well received. Uh, certainly, uh, Bob's uh, presentation was well attended. I was being the keynote and the first one in there. He got us all uh, we're losing Don here. Don, uh, maybe we could get you to call in on the phone. Um, of the of the uh, conference, and uh, which is what Bob does. So, I think it was a uh, well well uh, spoken. Uh, I got a text here from Pete Consigli, the the restoration industry's uh, global watchdog. You're saying it's more like twenty thousand licensed assessors and remediators. Let me try again. Um, yeah, Don, if you could try and call in again, we'd appreciate it. John Lapo, Terry, real quick, uh, thoughts on like what was the what was the most um, I guess the the best uh, received presentation uh, was it the keynotes? Was it some other you know the future of IAQ? Uh, what other what other one was well received? Well, I'd like to say that there was a pretty spectacular presentation on duck sweating and spray foam. I'm not sure who gave those. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, Joe, there were so many that were, it was tough to get to them all. And one of the beauties of the conference this year is that everything was videotaped and we're all able to go back and see the ones that we missed. It was just when I would come out of one that was really well, well attended and well received, the people next door would say, wow, you really missed this one next door. So I, I would say that the overall uh, overall opinion was that they were all really, really good presentations. John, I got a question for you on this, this spray foam issue. Um, I am seeing problems with exterior sheathing, and they're occurring more frequently in, and I'm, look, I'm looking at homes in the same plan, okay? Um, same home, similar homes similar construction except one may have spray foam uh, as the insulation the other may have fiberglass as the insulation and i'm seeing a quicker failure of exterior sheathing such as uh, you know the the synthetic stone they put up and the uh some of the some of the other like eaves etc in the homes with the spray foam um and I think it's because these homes don't get a chance to dry out from the inside. They, they, the spray foam is blocking that. And if you're not really, really careful about how you put that exterior sheathing on and that you have a good water resistant barrier behind it and an air resistant barrier behind it, I'm seeing problems more quickly in the homes with spray foam, which I think some people would think the opposite. Your thoughts on that? Well, we're seeing the same thing. And a lot of the problems come from the incorrect wall assembly. So you can change your insulation, but you also have to change the total construction and design of your wall assembly. 
So uh, part of the spray foam uh, investigation is the deconstruction of the wall assembly to determine whether or not that wall assembly was built right for that climate zone. Uh, we're also looking for delamination of the spray foam between the exterior uh, substrate and the foam. If that happens, especially in a Midwest or a Northern climate, you can have condensation between the foam and the exterior sheathing, and that causes a lot of uh, accumulation of vapor barrier, deterioration of the siding, delamination of, of the exterior facade. So there's so much spray foam being installed, so little oversight, so few people participating in the certification of the sprayers that uh, we're staying very busy. But it, it really starts with deconstruction of the wall assembly to make sure that that wall assembly was initially constructed correctly and that the spray foam is properly adhered to the exterior wall. Okay, thank you, John. And let's go real quick before we go to halftime. I want to get back to John Downey. John, any any other thoughts uh, or anything you'd like to add to what other guests have said here with respect to the conference season? <laughs> As far well, the way I'm looking at it is, that to me, the conference season is kind of only just beginning. So good point. Uh, the, although in the indoor air quality in Florida, that realm, I guess the uh, Florida season uh, just ended, but uh, with RIA coming up and uh, some other conferences, several other conferences are going on that are uh, more restoration related. Those are, um, um, I'll be on the road, honestly, more than I would like to be uh, for those. Well, the, in series as, now, putting together their uh, symposium. You want to talk just briefly about that, what you've got coming up, because I think it leads nicely into our discussion for the second half. Yes, yes, I uh, appreciate that. Yes, on um, uh, March 31st, uh, Siri is doing a symposium in Cincinnati. Uh, and in particular, uh, since it is a part, and it, it's a full day, uh, one, but one day symposium with four different sessions. Uh, and, and the most important one I wanted to kind of focus on is what leads to uh, our, the follow-up discussion about coronavirus. We have a session on pandemics uh, and pandemic, pan help me speak, pandemic Pre preparedness. Preparedness. Uh, and specifically as it relates to the coronavirus at this point. However, I, you know, it, it, was, it was important that we talk about pandemics and put that first because coronavirus is one manifestation of uh, a pandemic that we're right in the middle of right now. Uh, but it, that's an ongoing thing that uh, happens, recurs throughout time. Uh, it does seem to me that we are getting to be better and better prepared for these things. Although I also would have to say that Although we're, we're better prepared, it, it still seems like there's a, an awful lot of hype uh, that goes on in some quarters that, um, you know, kind of creates fear and, uh, of course, fear sells. So, you know, that's that's a part of the equation. But uh, Jean Cole and uh, Patricia Ollinger are the presenters for series uh, session on it. Uh, I. I Gene Cole is, I mean, I, I did not realize until a meeting the other day just how deep he goes uh, in, in infection control and, and, and this sort of thing. He goes back uh, many decades and, and has been involved in a lot of international as well as uh, American bodies in, in terms of uh, dealing with them. And Patty is, Patty actually was the person uh, in charge of pre preparing Emory University for the Ebola patients that came in, American Ebola uh, patients that came in several years ago from, uh, from that outbreak in Africa. And uh, she spoke at the IICRC technical conference that I put on a few years ago and was just excellent. So since then she has, uh, she's now, um, she was with Emory at that time, she's now with GBAC uh, which is a division of ISSA that uh, deals with uh, this sort of issue. It's a, a highly technical organization, and Patty, as the executive director, is is really a, a great fit for that organization. 
All right, we're going to talk more about these things in the second half. I also have some other text questions I see uh, on Ermi and other questions, I think, that are very current events. I uh, also w want to mention, be before we go to our break, um, that, you know, we're going to try and get Patty on the show here. John has, has graciously uh, helped us with that. And we're also going to try and get Dr. Alan Zelikoff on for next week. He's uh, an expert on these pandemics and, and infectious uh, outbreaks, I guess you would say. So really uh, looking forward to talking more about that next week. Let's stop, though, for just a minute and thank our sponsors. And we'll be back in 90 seconds with the second half of IAQ Radio. Before we do, I want to make sure I mention ACGIH, the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists, our newest sponsor. Gold sponsors are Particles Plus engineers and manufacturers of feature-rich particle counters and air quality monitoring instrumentation. Learn more at ParticlesPlus.com. Count on us. Healthy Indoors Magazine, a free online digital magazine for industry professionals and consumers. Subscriptions available at HealthyIndoors.com. And AEML Laboratories, free FedEx shipping, great pricing, same-day results, and never a rush fee. Learn more at AEMLinc.com. Gray Wolf Sensing Solutions, who use advanced sensor software technology and embedded computers to provide superior environmental test instrumentation. Visit them at WolfSense.com. Association sponsors are the Indoor Air Quality Association, a multidisciplinary organization dedicated to promoting the exchange of indoor environmental information through education and research. Learn more at IAQA.org and RIA, the Restoration Industry Association, the granddaddy of the restoration industry. Network with leaders. Learn more at restorationindustry.org. Siri, the Cleaning Industry Research Institute. See more deeply through science and research. Learn more at siriscience.org. That's C I R I science.org. Okay, we're back for the second half of today's open mic show. I also wanted to mention that, uh, John, uh, we figured out why we were off on the number of uh, professionals in Florida. Actually, there was about eight or 9,000 in each category of both in inspection and remediation. So the total was more like 18,000, which is a whole heck of a lot of people. Cliff, let me turn it over to you. I mean, we've had several shows on the uh, H1N1 and then on the avian flu. I suspect that this one may be a little different this time around with this coronavirus. I thought I'd first get your thoughts on how it may affect our industry because you've been in the disinfection world forever and uh, I want to get your thoughts. Well, you know, again, I, I think all of us look to people that we respect and who we feel know more about the issue than we do to, you know, to get our information. That's one of the reasons why I uh, spoke to Dr. Zelikoff earlier this week. He's very concerned about it, and he thinks it's different uh, from a number of perspectives and feels that uh, within the next week or so, we'll know uh, a whole lot more about it. And there are certain things that he kind of brought to, uh, to my attention that I hadn't thought about. You know, we know this thing goes back to like no... November. And think about this for a minute. How many students from China go to school in the United States? Yeah. Yeah, a whole lot. And, you know, you know, to me alone, that, that was startling. And a lot of the things that we think about aren't necessarily what we think. And, uh, you know, he knows or we know that the virus can remain on materials such as stainless steel for eight or nine days. I was very surprised to hear from him that it does not survive on cotton fabric uh, for some reason. But I mean, he was concerned to the point that he's writing a, uh, a memo to his family about emergency precautions that he feels that, that, that they should take. So this is a little bit different. Now you see all these people running around with masks. Unfortunately, masks don't protect them. I think our industry goes crazy with, you know, how are we going to make money from this? 
And I, I think what happens is they're, they're trying to buy the strongest, uh, most uh, effective biocides uh, you know, that are out there. You know, they want to use biocides that were developed to kill anthrax or to kill tuberculosis, you know, to kill a coronavirus, which is not real difficult uh, to kill. It's, it's an enveloped virus. So I do have some, uh, you know, concerns about that. Uh, but, um, you know, we'll see. I'm really looking forward to spending an hour with them. Uh, well, the, biggest, the biggest fear that he has and the most dangerous part of it uh, is the United States ha and nowhere in the world do they have a communication system. And he said that the most important thing about the virus is time. Uh, this is about hours. This isn't about days. And when people are exposed, what happens is they're exposed, they wait a couple of days, then they go to the doctor, then they wait a couple of days. And, and what, the doctors don't communicate with one another. They don't communicate with the hospitals. Veterinarians don't communicate with doctors. And I think a bunch of people are extrapolating information and data based on some pretty poor information. So I think that's the, you know, his biggest fear. Okay, and uh, we had a question who you were getting this from. It's Dr. Alan Zelikoff. Uh, Dr. Zelikoff has been an expert in this area for many years. Worked in the Bush administration, actually, on uh, pandemic preparedness, I believe it was. So, uh, and bioterrorism, yeah. Very knowledgeable guy. Um, very concerned about this issue. And I'm, I'm wondering, Cliff, before we move on to the other guests, I, what, and maybe I'm wrong, but I go crazy every time I see them in China spraying disinfectant all over the streets and, uh, you know, fields and so on and so forth. I, I just feel like, why? I mean, is, is that something that you see as um, a positive? I mean, is it is it necessary? Is it overkill? Is it just trying to make it look like you're doing something? Well, I, I think one of the other things that concern too is uh, what happened on some of these cruise ships, uh, you know, with people. In terms of uh, you know in infections growing uh, among populations that were quarantined, and you know one of the other things we chatted about is, is one of the ways one of the doctors in China who was infected and uh, you know fortunately is okay feels that he got infected through his eye and, and essentially touched an inanimate surface, then touched his eye. And he noticed that, um, you know, the eye got red, he ended up having mucus and so on and so forth in the eye. And then he developed the, the symptoms, uh, the symptoms afterward. You know, one of the questions was why does that we just saw was an N95. Uh, N95 doesn't protect uh, against particles that are as small as viral particles. I mean, they can theoretically go right through. Uh, and it's, I'll, I'll spell his name. It's Z-E-L-I-C-O-F-F. -F. Don, I think we've got you back on the line now. And uh, I know you had, you had some concerns about how this and how it might affect our industry. Can you tell listeners a little bit about your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, uh, I see there are a number of questions. Wow, what an echo. Um, no. What, what I re really see as, a, as an issue is what the N95 should be used for. It should be used by those who are sick. The reason that you have it used for the sick people is that they can then prevent having coughing or spitting or anything else on other people. That's what the best use of the N95 is. It's not to be used by the individuals trying to prevent themselves from becoming ill. Okay. And and so I think that's the biggest problem we have. A lot of the health care people, as has been reported, both here in the United States and Iran and Italy, are being exposed without necessarily the proper personal protective equipment. All right, let's get back. I think we got Jack back here. We had a little trouble unmuting you, Jack. You were a little hesitant to, to discuss this today. I think uh, you may think it's a little a little premature maybe, but I don't want to speak for you. Please tell listeners your thoughts. Um, my concern is is um, 
the hype that it's getting. You know, bad news sells ad space, sells uh, commercials. Um, and um, I, I've actually had people you know, say to me that they're, they're concerned about going out to eat Chinese because of the coronavirus, hmm. uh, which is kind of absurd. Um, my other concern is, so I think at this point that there's a, there's an overreaction that, uh, that uh, we have the news media that is is um, instilling a great amount of fear um, into the public about this, um, uh, for which I'm not sure there's there's a basis for that. We've seen the stock market drop uh, over three thousand points. Um, over this. Uh, the other concern is that people are going to start running out and buying respirators um, needlessly uh, and then uh, the supply of respirators will not be there for the people who do need them, uh, such as the healthcare workers who are trying to address this situation. Okay. John Donny, let, let me get you in here for a moment because you, you've got your finger on the pulse of the restoration world and the the carpet cleaning world and so on. I'm wondering, um, are you aware of any shortages for people who are doing, you know, restoration work as far as, you know, Tyvek suits or uh, personal protective equipment, respirators, etc. And has anybody been um, talking to you or the folks at Siri about, you know, how they could uh, maybe get involved in this effort to try and help stop the, the, the pandemic? Well, first of all, no, I haven't... Uh Per, actually, on the business side, I haven't heard of any uh, shortages, although uh, I, I should clarify that in, in the restoration field, it's actually in the in the contract cleaning area. Jim Harris, the chairman of Siri, uh, it, who is a contract cleaner in the Albany, New York area, uh, he's had, his company has had a very difficult time. Uh, acquiring uh, masks for both for their employees as well as for clients who have requested that. So I, and then second, se secondly, I do have a sister who is trying to acquire um, protective a protective mask, and uh, she's had a hard time with it. But we've mostly just made fun of her uh, and, <laughs> and, and her efforts. Um, the, as far as uh, PPE, uh, generally, I have not heard anything. Uh, as you know, as I mentioned earlier, though, we're just getting to the restoration season uh, as far as shows and that. So I haven't been to any restoration shows yet, just to the the, the two that were last week. Uh, so I, I haven't heard anything. I I I, I think at this point, the, the, what it is is more to, as Jack mentioned, there, there's just a little bit of panic by people in, in terms of what am I going to do if, and um, I, I think it is really important uh, in, in all of the communications that we find ways to uh, be reassuring as opposed to stoking fears. Because if we, you know, if we reassure people, you know, um, you know this is not hopefully, <laughs> this is not the end of the world. Um, then uh, people can uh, do things in a, in a rational way and not overstate the fear. I, I was very interested in what Cliff was saying about uh, Dr. Z's take on it, uh, because as a medical professional uh, who obviously is involved in that area, it would seem to me that um, you know his concerns would be something that I, I think people should take seriously, and I think People should uh, take the, those things seriously, yet also uh, not overstate, you know, things. I mean, let's not jump ahead of where we are, uh, but stay, you know, in, in the moment, so to speak, as, as far as this. Um, I guess I would, at this point, I guess I would call this a crisis. I'm not sure it's even a medical crisis yet, except in, in uh uh, in China, but certainly it is a uh, crisis for people generally in terms of, of fear and uh, and reacting in irrational ways. 
John, with respect to the, I didn't think about that, the facilities cleaning industry, you know, a lot of these folks um, do facilities cleaning, and and I'm wondering, um, are they trained to handle this type of thing? Is that a, another type of training they're going to need? Um, how are they going to get it? A great question, and um, the the answer is yes and no say that but it's true mm -hmm. uh, and in the sense that uh, some of the some specialized contractors who work a lot in the healthcare field they have uh, protocols in place for for this sort of thing on a routine basis uh, but when we spread beyond that and and um, uh, this is something I actually was talking to somebody from ISSA earlier today about this um, when we get beyond the, for instance, we'll talk about hospitals. Uh, you move from that into uh, like uh, nursing homes or in the in the wild, wild west of the as assisted living world. Uh, there aren't high, there aren't really any uh, formal standards in place, and the uh, level of training and professionalism it varies widely. And that is, if I were looking at, if I do, as I look at this uh, coronavirus uh, issue, that would be, honestly, that would be the population I would be most concerned with. <laughs> the ones that are elderly and yet not in environments where there is a high level of understanding. Uh, Jim Harris, when I talked to him about this, I, it, this was a pretty interesting, uh, apologize for the, background noise it's all right buddy <laughs> um just, i'll tell you off camera what's going on and <laughs> not now though <laughs> uh, what what jim harris uh, said uh, that was very telling is he, he said that basically we have some level of training but for the most part training gets less and less efficient and effective the closer to the mop head that we are. The, mm -hmm. the actual person doing the cleaning is typically the worst trained. Higher level people tend to get good training and it filters down rather than and percolating up. And that's a little bit of a problem. Uh, the other thing that is you know, from Jim's perspective, and it's why I've been focused on it, uh, is really important is communication. When you're talking to people who have concerns, it is important to have good, useful information. And uh, a lot of people in the building service contracting industry uh, do not have that good of information. And unfortunately, sometimes the information that they get from the, from the media, going back to, I think it was Jack who said it a couple times, uh, the, it tends to be sensationalistic because people are looking for clicks and they're looking for reactions and that's what sells that's how you make money um that's the reality of the world that you have to be aware of but you know it's why siri wanted to do this and we brought in some people that are we feel are very serious minded and yet very responsible about this um and um because it Ultimately, that's what's going to carry us through this in a, in a proper way. I do think this is a um, uh, an opportunity for people in the cleaning and the restoration industry to shine and be uh, professional and uh, be uh, valuable to the public. Uh, I just hope that's the way it plays out. And, and uh, hopefully, you know, Siri's going to do its part. Uh, to facilitate that, but we're one of many players and not nearly as uh, large or encompassing as some of the others are. Let's uh, get the Z-Man back in here, and then I'd like to, if we still have Mike McGinnis, get a final thought from him and John Lapatero on this topic. Go ahead, Cliff. Thanks, Joe. I, I think, you know, one of the things that we see is we see a lot of publicity uh, about this. We see it on TV. We see it on we hear about it on the radio. I think the reason for that is there's no communication between, you know, the CDC, uh, you know, they, they put out information, then you have the state, then you have the local, and you have all these administrations that really don't communicate information to one another. 
they're not connected. And that's the thing that scares Zelikov uh, the most, is that uh, this can get out of control very, very, very quickly because of this lack of communication. And the scary thing is that when he worked for the government, he and some others developed a communication system for doing this. And uh, pretty much the government rejected it. And he, he, he opines that it's this pride situation. It's not invented here, so the government won't implement it. And I think we all know how powerful uh, pride can be. And, uh, you know, I think it's that's one of the reasons why uh, it could potentially be a pretty big issue. Mike, do we have still have you on the line, Mike McGinnis? I'm here. Mike, any thoughts on this uh, topic? Well, I mean, you know, we have a hard enough time getting people to get a flu shot when it comes out, but all of a sudden coronavirus gets in the paper and it's a big deal. I think the same way to approach it would be how we approach, you know, flu viruses and flu vaccines. Not that we have one for coronavirus, but it's getting more publicity. It's kind of like mold, more publicity than it deserves. Uh, I would think that the basic hygiene and cleaning procedures are going to be rel- you know, similar to other things we're already doing. Uh, we need money, which uh, apparently some in our government don't think it's that big a deal in the U.S. yet. You know, uh, it's not going to come here. Uh, I, <laughs> I, it's coming. And the other thing is, as far as training and all that, I, I don't think we know as much about the virus as we need to know. Uh, yeah, I don't think it's transmitted through the air, but, uh, you know, so uh, that, that's always good. But, uh, you know, before we can come up with a specific cleaning protocol, I think we need to know more about, you know, how this virus behaves and what it can do and what it can't do. Very good. I appreciate that, Mike. And John Lapoter, any thoughts from you? The, the state of Florida has got uh, the Department of Health has a website, a page set up on their website. University of Florida has released guidance documents. The, the state of Florida is a little bit concerned with uh, the international airports in Miami and Orlando and the amount of cruise ships we have coming in and out of Florida. But uh, all in all, I think Florida is taking it pretty well. We're being pretty conservative about it. That's primarily because we haven't had any outbreaks in Florida. But but we're I think we're as prepared as we can be and as informed as we're going to be. Okay, I appreciate that. Let's go uh, real quick. I want to see if we can get the Restoration Industries Global Watchdog in here. Pete, can we can we get you to have a couple final comments before we wrap it up? Well, uh, two things. I, I've been paying attention to the little chat that's been going crazy over here, and I always get a kick out of those chats yes. from some of the, the regular uh, call-in listeners, or as Joe likes to say, our growing list of... Uh, how, how, what's, how do you say Growing that, group of loyal listeners. Yes, exactly. And now it should be the growing list of of uh, of uh, active uh, chat guys. But uh, look, so one of the things that came up in the chat uh, <laughs> very early on that lends to, quite frankly, a discussion that we've had before, uh, and this kind of ties off from maybe the winter break and some of the IEQA and the mole stuff, is how a lot of these restoration guys are trying to leverage the situation and uh you know uh the insurance you know the battles that they have with the insurance companies i mean there's certainly the guys like me and cliff and others have been around that's just preaching to the choir um i mean uh florida is particularly south florida dade broward palm beach it's really the new wild west you know years ago in the 90s when both of myself um, a lot of the buildup took place under the Water Loss Institute days under the old ASCR brand. It was Southern California. It was the Wild West. And in the late 80s, the whole reason this industry has a standard today, the S-500, was based in the late 80s with construction defect claims and sewer cleanup and litigation. And there were no standards. And, um, and so through the EPA and guys like Mike Berry and Gene Cole and others in the industry, and Claude Blackburn, the founder of Dreyes, uh, a lot of these guys, uh, they got together and they, they wrote a paper, a white paper that was published, uh, the remediation of sewage backflows of buildings. That essentially became category three in the S-500 years later. And the point was, is that there was no standard in the day and the attorneys didn't know how to litigate because they didn't know what the, the best practice was. And essentially they said, well, 
you know, if there's no standard, I guess they're just going to make stuff up. And that wasn't good. So the EPA came to us because it was a public health issue with the sewage not knowing. And that's basically how the industry went down the road to where we are today. Well, the point is industry has to stay vigilant. We need to constantly, you know, self-regulate. I mean, I remember the words, Downey, and you'll appreciate this. And Mike Berry said, he goes, you know, if you guys don't self-regulate, the government's going to do it for you and you ain't going to like what the government does. Well, we all, I think, realize that. So we did. They helped from afar. You know, they, they didn't influence it. They just made sure that we were on the track. And I think that was good. And the industry's learned how to, how to work with the government the best we can. So, uh, look, we have these issues that we have to deal with in the mold, the water, you know, these non-regulated areas. I mean, you know, the, the asbestos and the lead is regulated. There's not much you can do about that. Do we want to go down that same path in the mold and these environmental areas? I don't know. The question's up in the air. I mean, we have different viewpoints on it, and that's okay. That's the whole point of dialogue and discussion. I mean, what associations do and why people belong to them is very simple. You work together to associate, to do together what you can't do alone. And basic tenants are you provide a platform and a venue for all these nonprofit associations where the members and the stakeholders can have a free flow of exchange and ideas and information. You don't censor them. You have rules of engagement like antitrust laws, general decorum, so that you can have a vigorous debate, you know, and respect everybody's interest and let them weigh in and then you take what you want and what you don't agree with, you leave, and that's fine. It doesn't get into these personal attacks. That's how industries grow. That's how companies grow. That's how people do great things, not through petty BS. So before I slide off the back of the slippery political slope, which I'm resisting <laughs> doing, Downey, how come you're not smiling? You were supposed to smile when I said that. There you go. That's my boy. And uh, that's what this is all about. So instead of uh, us complaining about it, because we already know the issues are there, we got to come up with solutions to fix it. And quite frankly, the restoration industry is doing that. They're doing that through the AGA, through the work of Ed Cross, and, and under Springer's leadership and the, and the leadership of REA, and, 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 they're, and they're doing it the, through the PIRC, and, and which is a model from the collision industry. The, you guys like Dale Seller and others that advocated for that years ago. And that's starting to happen now. And the industry is growing and it's maturing. So get on board and help. You know, I, and I'll say Springer said something really important a year or two ago. We got into these contentious debates and he says, well, there's no point in beating a dead horse and, and identifying what the, what the issues are. We already know what the issues are. And you got to play the hand of your dealt. He said, if you want to weigh in, come up with ideas for solutions so we can move forward. And I, and I applaud him for that because that's the type of thinking that we need in the next gen generation of leadership that the industry is going to move forward. So uh, anyway, the last thing I'll say, Joe, is this. One of the key issues that I want to discuss in this open mic, which you guys have, have avoided, and I'm going to be very careful here because I don't want to get anybody sued. But, uh, oh, you're smiling there, Donnie, huh? Look, Ed Cross once said, I, I'm really a lawyer. I'm just not licensed to practice. So what I do is I stay in the risk management area and I stay away from giving legal advice. But one of the huge issues that our industry has is a lot of this propaganda putting on a, of the hocus pocus about how to get rid of mold. And, the, you know, this has happened in the past with a lot of commercial systems. And... You know, industry has to self-regulate that. It's okay if the trade journals and magazines is advertorials and people put their viewpoints in and have certain disclaimers. But sometimes the propaganda, and Cliff is a big one with this when he talks about parroting. And uh, Cliff, what's the what's the name of that lady? The, what's her name? Rachel Carson? Rachel Carson. Which lady? Rachel Carson. Isn't she the one with the... With the, with the... DDT? Yeah, exactly. So this stuff gets out of hand if it's not stopped. So the scientists, the people that are involved in this, they gotta speak up. They gotta know what battles to fight and which ones not to fight. And uh, I, 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 anyway, I don't think we've done a good job of addressing it. I think we've ignored it. I don't think regulating is the answer, but I don't think putting your head in the sand is either. You gotta find some balance in the middle so we get good information and then, you know, 
uh, let people decide. I think people are smarter. Sometimes we give them credit for. I don't think they need to be spoon fed. Give them good information. They can make these decisions. So, Joe, I'd, I'd like to see, you know, we could dedicate a, a show to just that topic, uh, whether it's an open mic or a specific topic with a bunch of experts in different areas to really delve into that. I, I don't need to say more publicly on that because a bunch of us in these threads, you know, we had some private emails and I, I think it's it's a, it's an issue that needs to be dealt with. But anyway, I think these open mic shows are pretty good. I, I didn't quite frankly know what to make of them when we talked about them, but you know, it's kind of like uh, one a month or at least one every other month. I think it's a good idea to do these open mic shows. So uh, add a boy and I'll, uh, anyway, I'll turn it over back over to my friends. Well, thank good you, job, Pete. Joe. We good always man. appreciate you joining us. And there was a lot of discussion in the chat about things like, you know, Ermi and, and uh, you know, some of, some of the testing that's going on with, uh, you know, PCR and so on and so forth and whether or not it's got, uh, you know, any validity behind it. And it's been, but it's being promoted a lot by, you know, some of the medical community. And I think that's a, that's something that's a show in itself. Uh, and we have to have the right guests on to, to make sure that we get some good solid opinions on it. But I, I want to thank everyone for joining us here this week. Um, a, a great group, a great discussion, John Donny, Mike McGinnis, uh, Jack Springston, John Lapoteer, who did I miss? Uh, I missed somebody. Don Weeks, can't miss Don Weeks. Um, my co-host, the Z-Man, Cliff Slotnick. Uh, I want to thank John. You got to have faith at the controls. These are a little tough on John. You got to have faith when we got five or six people calling in. Most importantly, our growing group of loyal listeners. There it is, Pete. Uh, please come back next Friday. Next Friday, we may pre-record the show. We want to get Dr. Alan Zelikoff on. I think we've almost got that arranged. We'll let you all know soon with the blog that comes out from this show. We'll see you next Friday at noon for the next episode of IAQ Radio Plus. For IAQ Radio, I'm Spike Reed saying thanks for listening. 